Say when, Kathy. I'm hoping. Uh, it says it's streaming live. Hi, all. Uh, great to be here today. I'm Alice Monet, an astronomer, a retired astronomer. And um, I'm really excited to be here with my old friend, Tyler Nordgren. We used to work together at the US Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station in Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, yeah, it's been a long time, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Alice. Yeah. I, gosh, 20 years ago, there in Flagstaff. <laughs> it's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, after, after leaving there, I went out to Southern California where I was a professor for, gosh, I think 18, 19 years. And being there Very in cool. Southern California, it really made me miss the Grand Canyon, the Four Corners, just absolutely spectacular, beautiful places out there. Oh, I know what you mean. After I left Flagstaff, I went to Washington, D.C. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Where I could see on a good night, maybe a dozen stars in the sky. Yeah, so. and one of those was oh. prob probably on approach to uh, you know, Reagan <laughs> National or something. That's right. Yeah. That's right. No, I, I had the same experience in Los Angeles. And it was, it was one of the things that first got me working with national parks. Oh, cool. And I've, I've always had this this. Uh, love of art, love of astronomy, and and travel. And one of the things that I, I started doing some work with, and in fact, it wound up being part of my, my first sabbatical from my university, was this intersection with art and science and inspiring people. And so like right here, I've got a photo uh, of one of the paintings that Thomas Moran did for that yeah, first- spectacular. Isn't that neat? I just, you know, people, People loved this. When he got back from that first expedition out to Yellowstone, everybody back east was just amazed at the beauty of this place. And it was well, it was didn't this inspire the whole, you know, tourist business to the to the national parks? Absolutely. And that's that's one of the things that makes this particular painting so special. Uh, and so one of the things that I've worked on is how things like art of these amazing natural places. Uh, inspired a sense of awe in people to get them to go out, protect, preserve those places. And what started with the stuff on the ground, places like, say, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, which is where we were out in Flagstaff, has really transitioned over the, the last several decades to the beauty above those parks at night. Wait, is, is... That, is that your photograph? No, no, this is Ansel Adams. But thank you for thinking so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So okay, wow. so here's so here's Ansel Adams' photograph of Old Faithful, and he had this this contract with the the National Park Service, the Department of the Interior, back in the in the 40s and 50s, to photograph these places. And it was one of those things that really put this on the map for that generation of photographers coming back from World War II, and you know everybody had cameras now. And so this is this is my photograph. Wow! Oh, that's awesome. Thank oh my you. gosh. Oh and my gosh. This is this is old faithful at, at night being lit up by the lights of the lodge there, but behind it you've got the Milky Way. That is amazing. Oh. So okay, so let me ask you. You're uh where are you living right now? Uh we're living in Albuquerque. Okay. So the skies so, are dark here. Yep. <laughs> Not Flagstaff dark, but still pretty good. <laughs> now, if, if you were to go out on your front porch and you were to look up, could you see the Milky Way from your house? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Current estimates are that 80% of U.S. European uh, populations cannot see the Milky Way from, from where they live. That's really sad. And it, it's, just, it's just getting worse. Um, and so one of the things I've worked with, the 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 Park Service, uh, National Park Service about, is this idea of, yeah, people go to Yellowstone to see the geysers. But just like the old Sea America campaign in the 1930s, uh, we've got this, this new campaign that, that uh, I developed over the last, I guess, 10 years at this point, of See the Milky Way. And the idea that half the park is after dark. Ooh, and that's just automatically transitioned. Go back here. 
<laughs> and so it's it's the it's the same idea to so go out and see that natural beauty above. And it's it's really hit quite a, a, a chord with the park service and with with uh, the, the visiting public, because most people, if they are going to see the Milky Way, you're going to see them from someplace like a national park. Right. So, well, we're but, really lucky because we're on the on the western edge of Albuquerque. And we look oh. out from our yard, we look out over the Rio Grande and towards Chaco, over the volcanoes. And, oh. um, and so there really is very little development in that direction. Most oh. of the lights of the city are to our east and, and uh, we don't look in that direction, so. Exactly. And it, it's one of those things that it gets worse every year. And I've, I've been out to Chaco uh, and even in the 20 years I've been going out to Chaco, you can actually see that the skies are getting brighter out there from various development, uh, yeah. coal mining, mineral extraction that takes place around there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, one, of the, one of the things I've been doing with the Park Service is in addition to trying to help them get their rangers to be able to talk about the night sky. In fact, Right now, I'm supposed to be out in Death Valley doing park ranger training, but because of the current sort of nationwide shutdown, that's not happening. Yeah. But one of the things I've been doing is developing um, materials for them for being able to share with the public, well, what else can you see in this national park? What other aspects of this natural world can give you a sense of what it might be like to be on another planet, for instance? And just to keep going with that, that, that art theme, here's a, a painting by uh, Chesley Bonestell from 1952 yeah. of Saturn from what he imagined Titan to be like. He was so amazing. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, those, those paintings, and for, for really astronomers of our generation, you show somebody one of the Bonestell's paintings and it just, there's something I just inside that you know, you're like a catch in the throat. It's like, oh yeah. That's, that's the way space was supposed to be like, wasn't it? Yeah. So one of the things that, while there, there aren't those mountains uh, on Titan, if you go a couple moons over, you've got Enceladus. And one of the amazing things from Saturn's moon Enceladus is that you've got these geysers that erupt from giant cracks in the South Pole. And it was the first place that, that uh, water geysers were, were observed elsewhere in the solar system. And how and, high are those geysers compared to Old Faithful? Do you happen to know? So imagine if you were to scale uh, scale this thing so that you could be standing on a boardwalk on Enceladus, those geysers would go up thousands of kilometers. In wow. fact, the gravity is so much lower there. Enceladus is about the size of Texas, uh, so pretty small. Um, so that gravity is so weak that that water that jets out from inside Enceladus flash freezes into snowflakes. And those snowflakes awesome. mostly achieve escape velocity and they, <laughs> they go into orbit around Saturn oh and gosh. they become one of the rings. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that, that's fascinating. When I, when I did my sabbatical at the national parks, uh, I was out in Yellowstone in the middle of winter and I, I got it before dawn, and this was like January, went out and I saw Old Faithful erupt by, by moonlight. And oh. I could feel the little snowflakes falling on my cheeks there oh, as, as wow. all that hot water froze in the atmosphere and fell okay. back down again. Okay, all right, I know where I'm going next. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, if you, if you, you know, when you think about it, it's like, okay, so we've got geysers on Earth, geysers on Enceladus. And so imagine if you could stand there, you would you you could imagine being on this moon of Saturn. And so things things like that, those those sorts of connections, the night sky overhead where you can see Saturn, those have, have really struck a chord in the, the public over the last two decades, uh, to the point where a lot of parks have big star parties now. And you get local amateur astronomy clubs coming in to help out. And a you know, place like Grand Canyon, where we were. Uh, you is that what this is? Is this Grand Canyon? So this is Grand Canyon. And you've got people from, you know, visitors from all over the world. 
but you had the astronomy clubs from, from down in Flagstaff and folks who'd come from as far away as Las Vegas to bring their telescopes and all over the South Rim. Yeah, you'd be able to, you'd be able to see a sky full of stars. Oh, so yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I just, I, it was heartbreaking to, to leave that uh, when I went out to California, but it's, you know, it's the kind of thing that if you, when you get the public out there and they see this for, for the first time, they get this sense of awe, this, this feeling yeah. of, wow, there's this whole universe out there. And there's, there have actually been uh, some psychologists who've studied this feeling of awe that people develop. And mm -hmm. they say that one of the, the neat side effects of this is that if you, you get to experience awe, you feel a sense of wonder and a connection because you realize that the universe isn't just you. It's this, this larger world of stars and galaxies and other people and the planet as a whole. And so there, there may actually be this benefit to feelings of awe that it makes oh, us I'm sure. better people. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. And I know in times of stress, um, I've gone out and looked at the night sky and it puts all my problems into perspective. It's like, okay, yeah. so the universe is a big place. This is not a big problem, <laughs> whatever <Yep>. the problem was. <laughs> Because you, know, you, you, I, I remember when I was doing this with students, I, the, the first reaction that students would have is, wow, I feel so small. Mm -hmm. And in one sense, yeah, that could be a bad thing. But in another, if, if we're small, it's only because we're part of something vastly larger. And then you can right. explore that connection. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's one of the, the things that makes Grand Canyon such a, a spectacular place, for instance. You go out to one of the overlooks on a moonless uh, night and you've got this darkness above you and the darkness below with the stars above and just, you know, it, This is it, spectacular. It, when, what time of night was this picture taken? So this one, I took it in January and yeah. it was, I think I had a three or a four day old crescent moon in the sky. So this was probably oh. somewhere around maybe nine or 10 o'clock. Wow. And so you had the, the moonlight lighting up the canyon and the only light down there, uh, you can see in the lower right and that's from Phantom Ranch down at the bottom. And, uh, and in fact, this, this photograph, I, I started working with the park rangers and uh, one of the things they wanted to do was find ways of, of better shielding the lights down there at Phantom Ranch given that it was the only source of light down in the canyon for yeah. hundreds of miles. Well, this is spectacular. And um, it reminds me of times that I've been at the canyon late at night and the tourists are mostly gone because they think the only time to see it is in the daytime. <laughs> and the real treat is after dark. Yep. And that was why I uh, came up with the slogan, this was probably about 10 years ago, half the park is after dark. Right, and right. It, it was to get people to go out and stay out after the sun went down. And it's Excellent. it's been amazing. Um, you know, and I, I put this poster in here uh, because it, it's it's not just visitors. It's not just the, the public that gets uh, amazed and uh, at, at what they can see in say places like Grand Canyon. But even back in the in the 60s, before the astronauts went to the moon, they went out to the national parks uh, in order to, because they imagined that might right. be some way of, of imagining what it might be like when they finally got to the moon. Um, so yep. that was a, a really neat anniversary this last last year. Let's see. What Didn't some of them go to Meteor Crater in Arizona? They did. Uh, and so you, you wound up with, with the astronauts at these national parks, at monuments, at state parks up in Oregon. Uh, where there were a lot of volcanoes. Uh, and then you had folks out at Meteor Crater in order to figure out, because I mean, one of the big questions about the moon was, what are those craters? Are they impacts? Are they volcanoes? Uh, right. And so they wanted to give them examples of both in order to be able to do a better job when they got to the moon. Yeah. That's and it was when cool. this, this last year I got to meet uh, former astronaut David Scott, who's the commander for Apollo 15. 
And mm -hmm. his, his mission was the first one really dedicated to geology. And uh, I got a chance to talk to him last summer. And he cool. loved, 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 loved Grand Canyon. And we, he didn't want to talk about the moon. And, you know, and that was great. <laughs> he wanted to talk about Grand Canyon. So, yeah. Anyway, but you that's know, that's, cool. yeah. And you mentioned Chaco Canyon. So, uh, so here's, here's Chaco wow. Culture National Historical Park. This is fabulous. Oh my gosh. Oh, thanks. So this is, this is one of the big kivas out there, yeah. uh, Casa Rinconada. Wow. And notice anything interesting about the alignment between the, the doorway that I'm sitting in and the doorway on the other side of the, uh, the kiva? Absolutely. Look at that, aligned with the celestial pole. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's one of the things that, that demonstrates that the, the folks out there, you know, people have been paying attention to the sky uh, you know, for as long as we've been people, yeah. uh, you, you, I suppose you could get this alignment by chance, but, uh, there's, there's enough alignments <laughs> like that. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, um, yes. this is, this is Kathy. We have a question, oh, wow. um, uh, that says, um, apologies if this was already answered, but what are some of the best parks to see the stars without light pollution? Oh, that's a great question. Well, uh, Thanks to the work with Park Service and the International Dark Sky Association, uh, there have been a number of parks that have been designated International Dark Sky Parks. And there's about a dozen of those in the, in the US. And the, these are to, to recognize parks with incredibly dark skies that are working to preserve those dark skies and are working with the visitors and the local communities to educate them about the importance of dark skies. The, the first one was Natural Bridges National Monument in Southern Utah. And that was back in 2007. Uh, but others are places like Death Valley, Grand Canyon, uh, Bryce Canyon, Big Bend National Park out in right. West Texas. Right. Um, Chaco, Chaco Culture has become a dark sky park. And although, as you can see in this uh, photo, uh, this video, You've got the lights uh, shining underneath the uh, clouds off in the distance. And that's Albuquerque off there in the left. Um, oh, no. So <laughs> even, even the dark places uh, are having, having some hard times. Well, here's, here's a, a map that I can show you. So these are, these are, this is a satellite image of lights uh, from the Earth. Here, we've got in color coded how those lights sort of spread out into the sky to uh, affect the darkness of the sky directly overhead in any spot on the US. Uh, black is the darkest, then you go through purple up through the rainbow uh, where red and white are, the, are the, uh, the, the brightest. And then showing in red are national parks and monuments and recreation areas. And then blue, you've got the interstate freeway systems. So places like Capitol Reef, um, Canyonlands, Natural Bridges, Bryce, all those places in Southern Utah are right there in the middle of those, that black dark sky country of Southern Utah and Northern Arizona. Um, but Yellowstone, Yellowstone up in Northwest Wyoming or Crater Lake out in uh, South, Southeastern Oregon. Those are do, spectacularly dark places. Do you know of any places that are decently dark in the Eastern half of the US? Well, gosh, I'm so glad you asked. So here's, here's that same map for the East Coast. And so you can, you can immediately see uh, how different it is. Uh, the darkest places on the East Coast that I'd recommend uh, that are easy to get to are places like Acadia National Park up in Maine. Uh, you can easily see the Milky Way from there. And they have a big star party in the end of September, beginning of October. Um, if you're in Virginia, Southern Virginia, down in the uh, Staunton River uh, area. There's a state park there that's got an amazing dark sky with a, a, a dark, uh, dark sky party that they hold there in the fall. Um, West Virginia, amazingly, beautifully dark skies. Um, and then up in, in uh, north central Pennsylvania, a place like uh, Cherry Springs State Park, uh, have some of the darkest skies on the, on the east coast. So just absolutely beautiful places. So you, you don't have to travel to the desert Southwest. 
And, and there's also uh, in the, uh, the Great Lakes area, places like uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore in Northwestern Michigan. So yeah. Let's That's very see. cool. That's very cool. It, oh, here's a, here's a question. So Alice, do yes. you know what the dividing line is between the light half of the country and the dark half of the country that you can see here? I would guess it's the Mississippi. Wow, well, well, the Mississippi is farther east than that. Oh. No. Yeah. Hmm. It's not the Rocky Mountains. That's the other. That's the other answer I usually get. Um, so that's about the hundredth meridian, and it's about where uh, you get uh, into the essentially the, the the part of the U.S. where where streams and rivers are more seasonal, uh, as opposed to all year long. So people follow the, the water and lights follow the people. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so here's, here's, a, here's one of the posters that I did for Big Bend National Park when they were designated an International Dark Sky Park. With a famous motto. Yeah. Half the park is after dark. Yeah, so this would be my recommendation. This is the darkest park that I ever saw. Uh, when I was out there, I spent about three or four nights camping in the, the back country south of the Chisos Mountains, where my view was, was out over the Rio Grande towards Mexico. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, there, there was not a single source of artificial light that was visible to the eye uh, or to my camera. Uh, and I, for all intents and purposes, felt like the electric light bulb hadn't even been invented yet. I think McDonald Observatory is out that way, isn't it? Yes, it is out in West Texas. Yeah, because I've done some observing from there and it was fantastic. <laughs> it, and they've, they've got an amazing visitors program out there too. And I, I spoke to uh, one of the fellows at McDonald who's in charge of their uh, night sky preservation uh, group. And one of the things that he was trying to do was reach out to the, uh, the oil fields, to the, uh, the various oil exploration companies out there in order to try to get them to help shield their lights and uh, help preserve the, the dark skies out there. So, you know, if you can imagine, even in West Texas, uh, the lights are beginning to encroach. Well, yeah. hey, I hope uh, it's successful. <laughs> hey, Tyler and Alice, can you yeah. reintroduce yourselves to a couple of our online uh, viewers? Oh, sure. sure. Um, I'm Alice Monet, uh, an astronomer. Uh, now retired, uh, and also uh, an enthusiast about the uh, dark night sky and and the national parks. And I'll let Tyler introduce himself. Uh, so I'm I'm Dr. Tyler Nordgren. I'm a retired astronomer. Uh, I was a professor for 18 years, and now I've gone into business for myself. So I, I actually have my own company, Space Art Travel Bureau where I uh, help promote dark skies, mostly in, in national parks. Uh, but I also lead tours for Betchart expeditions. And so we go to see the Aurora in Alaska, eclipses around the world. And I, I even do tours on occasion, uh, rafting trips down the Grand Canyon, where we take a telescope along in order to see dark skies at the darkest time of the month. Let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah, so I mean, one, of the, one of the big, you know, guiding thoughts that I have with trying to get people out into national parks is this, this John Muir quote, uh, you know, we travel the Milky Way together, trees and men. So really should be people, but you know, it's, it's true. You <laughs> get, you get people out into the wilderness, out away from city lights and you get to see, you know, here's, here's Bryce Canyon, for instance. Um, Beautiful. Gosh, you know, you just, that's, it's a view of our universe that we used to be able to have from any spot on earth. But over the last 100, 150 years, we've pushed the night away from our cities and communities to the point where you, you have to go and find the Milky Way now. You can't just see it from wherever you happen to be. Very true. Oh, but these... Yeah. They're wonderful. These are so inspiring. Thank wow. you. I, uh, Glacier National Park. Um, 
up on the Continental Divide. I spent a couple nights there at that, that backcountry chalet that you have to hike into. And when I first started working with the national parks, and this was about a little over 10, 12 years ago, oh gosh, 13, 14, now that I'm thinking about it, there, there were folks, I, I still remember one, of, one park superintendent coming up to me and saying, well, what does the night sky have to do with my park? And as if it was, this was just some silly add on that it really wasn't the, uh, the goal or the mission of his particular park to do anything with the night sky. But yet, you know, imagine if you were to be in a place like this out in, in Glacier and instead of having that Milky Way arching overhead, imagine you were to replace that with the, the orange glow of Los Angeles or New York City. Hmm. You know, would, would the park really be the same? Would you really be having this back to wilderness experience under a sky like that? So did the ranger get to see the stars? Did he stay up after dark? <laughs> well, as it turns out, I never actually got to see that superintendent again, but... Oh. About uh, eight years after that, I was a keynote speaker uh, at Grand Canyon for their annual star party. And when I was introduced to the superintendent of Grand Canyon, I remember he, he shook my hand and said, you know, I am so glad to have, have you all here uh, because you know, half the park is after dark. <gasps> <laughs> and you know, to, to have somebody quote you back to yourself uh, after a, awesome. a decade of work. It was like, all right, I've, I've had an impact. I've, I've, you know, yes, things you are changing. Have. Yes, you have. <laughs> and so, I, so uh, Kathy, go back to your question about the East Coast. Here's a picture of the night sky above Acadia National Park in Maine. And yeah, down there in the horizon, you've got the, the lights looking on down towards Portland, uh, Portland, Maine. But overhead, you know, the, the Milky Way is just absolutely spectacular there. So, and, and here's actually an instance in which the, the local Chamber of Commerce uh, for Bar Harbor right outside the park has been a, a huge advocate for dark skies because they know it brings visitors to the park and to the community. Excellent. And then Bryce Canyon. So Bryce Canyon was just uh, recently declared an international dark sky park. And I, I really think that program uh, has been so wildly successful with raising the awareness with the public about dark skies and that dark skies are something that, well, okay, it's unfortunate that you have to travel to see, but let's make it something that we actually consciously travel to see. And like with Maine and Bar Harbor, if people go to see it, the local businesses will realize it's something important to save. Exactly. So let's see what else do we have here. Oh yeah, and so that's that's one of the reasons why I've been very very happy to work with the uh, the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, in fact, I used to be one of the board members mm -hmm. on it. So yeah, let's see. So there's dark skies. Oh yeah, and when, when Grand Canyon was declared an international dark sky park, uh, they asked me if I could design a plaque for them that they could put outside the visitor center. And so here's the, the plaque that just got installed uh, right outside of the visitor center. So Very nice. So Tyler and Alice, before we go today, um, mm -hmm. I just wanna say, is there, now that we've got a lot of people with more time on their hands and the weather's getting a little nicer, are there any suggestions that you have for folks who might want to do a little naked eye or binocular observing um, that, you know, uh, even in some light polluted areas, are there any things that they might be able to look for? Hmm. Well, let's see here. Um, so as we come on up to the summer, uh, the summer Milky Way uh, is going to be rising earlier and earlier. Right now we're here in late March, beginning of April. And so it's the kind of thing you'd have to get up really before dawn in order to see it high overhead. But that's gonna to change to middle of the night and to evening as, as we get on into summer. Who knows if we'll, we'll all still be sort of confined to our homes by, by the time that happens. But what I'd recommend is, um, you know, just start with something like the crescent moon 
when you see the crescent moon, go out and if you've got a pair of binoculars, even something with as little as maybe 10 magnification, you'll be able to see the craters on it. And that's, that's I, I'm still inspired by that. What about you, yeah, Alice? Absolutely. And um, I often go out in the evening in my backyard here in Albuquerque and just sit in an armchair and look out with binoculars. And, and I'm amazed, even when the sky is a little bit bright, as it is oh. near any big city. Um, through binoculars, I can see tremendous detail. I can see color. I can see the Orion Nebula and the nebulosity yes. around it. Um, it doesn't take a high powered telescope and it doesn't take a national park sky to enjoy the universe. Um, yeah. you, can, you can do it from home. And I think that's, I, I actually remember spending some nights in Arlington and I'm sure Kathy has done this too because I've seen her pictures, <laughs> you know, just looking up, just looking, you know, knowing that it's there and taking the time yeah. to look pays off. Absolutely. Yeah, it's for a lot of folks, even as little as maybe a half hour, an hour's drive, if you're able to do that, could yeah. get you someplace dark, uh, dark enough that you can even see a hint of the, the Milky Way. Uh, where I am up in central New York, I can't see it from my backyard, but a half hour away, I'm, I'm off in a state park and I can, right. I can definitely see it there. And especially in a time where we're all trying to social distance, going out to a park at night, there's not an awful lot of folks there. And so it's a little easier to avoid the crowds, be, be a bit more healthful uh, and get to see the, the stars. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. From, from Washington, D.C., if you head west on 66, I think it's only an hour or so to the west that you get to Sky Meadows mm. State Park, which is very dark. And if you make it over the first ridge of the Blue Ridge into the Shenandoah Valley, it's still very dark. And that's not a long drive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, yep. the, and, you know, and even if you can't, the stars will be waiting for us when we finally do get back there. That's great. Hey, folks, I want to thank you um, for for giving us such a, a lovely view of the, the national parks and the skies and um, what we can see when we go there. Um, I hope that uh, our viewers have enjoyed this and I hope that they'll be interested in seeing some more conversations with astronomers and other scientists. Uh, let us know if uh, this is something that you're interested in seeing more of. Uh, until then, uh, unless there's any questions from the audience right away, I guess we'll sign off and, and let you get back to uh, all the, the things you were doing in your social <laughs> distancing before we started. Uh, any final thoughts, Tyler, Alice? Oh, this has been oh, fun. Yeah, happy to have been a part of this. Okay.